All right, let's open our Bibles to Luke chapter 2. As we kind of opened up with last Sunday evening, the time that things going on here, there's a lot of turmoil going on. Israel is under Roman rule and no longer really sovereign in their own. They're under the control of an oppressive government. There's a lot of things going on. But also there was an undertone, maybe not just an undertone, but there was an expectation or an expectancy of the people, of the Jews, that the Messiah would come. As we look through some of this stuff, as we see through the Gospels, you can, you can see that, it's put there, um, that they had some expectation. But their expectations did not always line up with what the Word of God showed them. And their expectations were not always what God provided for them. We've all had expectations of the Lord, right? How many times has the Lord done something far beyond what we ever expected? The Lord goes beyond our expectations, and we'll find out that that's what He does now. We want to take a look at chapter 2. Christ is born to Mary. The shepherds have spread the word through the town. We found out that that whole manger thing probably wasn't as shiny as we make them at Christmas time. But as they go and they present Jesus on the eighth day, in verse 21 there, it says, And when the eighth day was complete for the circumcision of the child, his name was called Jesus, the name given by the angel before he was conceived in the womb. Verse 22, now when the days of her purification, according to the law of Moses, were complete, they brought him to Jerusalem to present him to the Lord, as it is written in the law for the Lord, uh, for the law of the Lord, every male who opens the womb shall be called holy to the Lord, and to offer a sacrifice according to what is said in the law of the Lord, a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons. And behold, there was a man in Jerusalem whose name was Simeon. And this man was a just and devout man, waiting for the consolation of Israel, and the Holy Spirit was upon him. And it had been revealed to him by the Holy Spirit that he would not see death before he had seen the Lord's Christ. So he came by the Spirit into the temple, and when the parents brought in the child Jesus to do for him according to the custom of the law, he took him in his arms and blessed him and blessed God and said, Lord, now you are letting your servant depart in peace according to your word. For my eyes have seen your salvation, which you have prepared before the face of all peoples, a light to bring revelation to the Gentiles and the glory of your people. Israel, and Joseph and his mother marveled at those things which were spoken of him. Then Simeon blessed them and said to Mary his mother, Behold, this child is destined for the fall and rising of many in Israel, and for a sign which will be spoken against. Yes, a sword will pierce through your own soul also, that the thoughts of many hearts may be revealed. Simeon here in the temple led of the Lord has an expectation. It says that he was waiting on the consolation of Israel. As you read through the Old Testament and Isaiah and several different places, there, there's a, a promise to Israel of restoration, a promise of peace. Israel at the time being under the control of the Romans were praying for that. They were expecting that. They were waiting to be delivered, but they were waiting to be delivered from the hands of the Romans. Zacharias, um, John the Baptist's father, as he finally opened his mouth after he was born, he began to speak, and he refers to Isaiah um, chapter 40. Let's take a quick look there. Chapter 40, verse 1. Comfort, yes, comfort my people, says are your God. Speak comfort to Jerusalem and cry out to her that her 
warfare is ended, that her iniquity is pardoned, for she has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. The voice of one crying out in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord. Make straight in the desert a highway for our God. Every valley should be exalted, every mountain and hill brought low. The crooked places shall be made straight, and the rough places smooth. The glory of the Lord shall be revealed, and all flesh shall see it together. For the mouth of the Lord has spoken. The voice said, Cry out, and he said, What shall I cry? All flesh is grass, and all its loveliness is like the flower of the field. The grass withers. The flower fades because the breath of the Lord blows upon it. Surely the people are grass, the grass withers and the flower fades, but the word of the Lord stands forever. O Zion, you who bring good tidings, get up into the high mountains. O Jerusalem, you who bring good tidings, lift up your voice with strength. Lift it up, be not afraid. Say to the cities of Judah, behold your God. Behold, the Lord God shall come. With a strong hand, and his arm shall rule for him. Behold, his reward is with him, and his work before him. He will feed his flock like a shepherd. He will gather the lambs with his arm, and carry them in his bosom, and gently lead those who are with young. Isaiah prophesying here and about that Messiah to come. At the time, he's talking about the Babylonian captivity and their freedom from there, but the, the, the greater fulfillment of this, the spiritual fulfillment of this, looks forward to Christ, the Messiah. There's a lot of different scriptures, we won't go through all of them, we don't have time, that point to this. And there was an expectation of that Messiah to come and deliver them. Simeon was waiting for that, he was expecting that, the Holy Spirit was working in him, showing him that are leading him to go to the temple, promising him that he would see the Lord's Messiah to come. And then after that, he could go in peace. Simeon, like most of the people, were looking for their salvation. But Simeon, like most of the people, well, maybe not Simeon, but most of the people were looking for that earthly material salvation not that spiritual salvation that the Lord was bringing. Um, Back in Luke, another one there at at the temple at this time that was looking for this was a lady called Anna, verse 36 in chapter 2. Now there was one, Anna, a prophetess, a daughter of Penuel, the tribe of Asher. She was of great age and had lived with a husband seven years from her virginity. And this woman was a widow of about 84 years who did not depart from the temple but served God with fastings and prayers night and day. And coming in that instant, she gave thanks to the Lord and spoke of him to all those who looked for the redemption of Jerusalem. Simeon, his, his deal there, he spoke to Joseph and to Mary about the Christ and told them, of his expectation. Anna, she spoke to all those that were hanging around. When she saw Jesus, she cried out. Well, she may not have cried out, but she spoke out. That, hey, here he is. You guys are looking for the redemption of Israel. Here he is, this baby. But Jesus wasn't quite what everyone was expecting, was he? They were expecting something else. How is this baby going to deliver us from the rule of the Romans? Joseph of Arimathea. You can read about him in Mark chapter 15, verse 43. As he came and he took the the body of Christ there to go and and bury him, he was another one, it says, that had this expectation of Jesus, of the deliverer. Um, Jesus, uh, at the triumphal entry, when he came into town riding on the donkey and they put the palm fronds in their clothes there and they cried out, Hosanna. To the Lord, to the highest, they held him as king. As this time they saw him, were thinking that this was the guy, that this was the one. The people of those days, if they were studying the scriptures and understood the scriptures, they could have went back to Daniel chapter 9. Let's take a look there real quick. 
Daniel chapter 9, verse 25. Know there and understand that from the going forth of the command to restore and build Jerusalem until Messiah, the prince, there shall be seven weeks and 62 weeks. The streets shall be built again and the wall even in troublesome times. That command went out to go back and to rebuild Jerusalem. And those guys that do the math on all this stuff with the seven years and the 63 years and the 490 years and all that stuff, I didn't do the math. I let them do it. I just read about it in their commentaries, and I believe them. They say that this, based on on their calendars, on a Jewish 360-day-a-year calendar, brought them right to the day that Jesus entered in on that donkey. They were looking at this and paying attention. You know, they, they may have known this. We already found out that the, the wise guys from the east, they had some information on this. They followed the star. They knew where the Christ was to be born at. The scripture was there. The scripture pointed to that. The scriptures indicated the, the circumstances and the time. We, today, we look and see the, the time and the seasons, and we have expectations too, don't we? I'm not going to get ahead of myself. We'll come up to that. We had expectations, and so did they. There were plenty of things, plenty of signs. The scripture was there, and the Holy Spirit was working in the lives of the people. Later on in in John chapter 12, it talks about many of the rulers of the synagogues and those. They came, they believed when they saw Jesus, when they saw what he did. They searched the scriptures, they understood, and said, this is the Messiah, the scriptures foretold. Many of them believed, but they were afraid to say anything because they didn't want to get kicked out of the synagogues. So they kind of kept that to themselves. But there were those that believed, that looked forward to this, that knew he was the Christ, that believed that he was. But their expectations fell short of what he came to do. Luke chapter 24. We'll turn there. Verse 21, we know the story of these two guys on the road to Emmaus, walking along, talking about the things that had been happening, how Jesus was crucified and died, and it was the third day. Some of the people, some of the women had said that the the tomb was empty, that they saw him. Some of the other disciples had gone and seen that it was empty, but they didn't see Jesus. These guys are walking back trying to make sense of what's going on. Someone shows up. He says, what are you guys talking about? What is this conversation that you're having? Say, what are you, a stranger? Where have you been hiding? Everybody knows what's been going on. He says, oh, look at, at verse 21 in that story. All right, verse 20, it says, And now the chief priest and, the, and our rulers delivered him to be condemned to death and crucified. And they say, But we were hoping that it was he who was going to redeem Israel. Indeed, besides all this, today is the third day since these things happened. Yes, a certain women of our company who arrived at the tomb early astonished us. When they did not find his body, they came and saying that they had also seen a vision of angels who said he is alive. And certain of those who were with us went to the tomb and found it just as the women said, but him they did not see. They were hoping, they say, that he would be the one to come and deliver Israel from their bondage. What bondage? The bondage to the Romans. They had this hope and this expectation. Jesus was put to death on a cross. Jesus was buried in the tomb. Three days later, no one could find him. Their hopes and their expectations were dashed. And they're walking back to Emmaus, giving up. Guess we were wrong. Guess the Lord didn't answer our prayers. Guess the Lord let us down and didn't do what we had hoped he would. We were so built up, so pumped up after seeing everything that we, that we saw him do, all the miracles, all the healings, all the teaching. And now look, they can't even find his body in the tomb. Forget it. Let's just go home. Their expectations weren't met. 
and they were heartbroken. Those expectations went on further than that. Look at Acts chapter 1. Acts chapter 1, the disciples and everyone, they had already seen the risen Lord. He had showed up there in that upper room with them. He'd seen, they'd seen him as they were fishing out there and had breakfast with him. He had been seen by the 500. They knew that he was resurrected. He brings them together just before he ascends up into heaven. And in uh, verse 6, he tells them to wait there in, in Jerusalem so, that before, so they can be baptized with the Holy Spirit, not many days from then. Verse 6, it says, Therefore they had come together, they asked him, saying, Lord, will you at this time restore the kingdom to Israel? And he said to them, It is not for you to know the times or seasons which the Father has put in his own authority, but you shall receive power when the Holy Spirit comes upon you, and you shall be witnesses to me in Jerusalem and in all Judea and Samaria and to the end of the earth. Even at this time, from Emmaus, the Lord opened their eyes and they saw who he was and they knew that it was the Lord. He'd shown himself, the resurrected Lord, and still yet their focus were on the earthly things and restoring the kingdom, delivering them from their bondage to these earthly things. Their focus was all on that. Lord, are you going to do it now? Now that you're resurrected, how much fun would that have been for them to go with the resurrected Lord to the temple? And say, hey guys, remember me? How much would have that lifted them up? To see him at that point to go and, and go before Pontius Pilate and say, you know what? I am the king. Step over, buddy. Step aside. That's what they were looking for. That's what they were expecting. The Lord had greater things in mind, didn't he? We look at this, we see in this time that their expectation was there. That the scripture led them to this. The promises were there. The signs of the times were all there. But their eyes were focused on themselves and the things of the earth. So what are we expecting? What are we expecting today? What are we expecting now? What are we expecting in our country? What are we expecting in this world? What are we expecting to come? A great revival? Great times of trouble? What are we expecting? What are we expecting in our own personal lives, our own personal walk with the Lord? Sometimes what we expect or what we hope for is not always what we get, is it? Do we expect blessing? Absolutely, don't we? Lord says he will bless us. But are the things that we are blessed with always what we're looking for? Look at Matthew chapter 5. We know this. This scripture called the Beatitudes. I always looked at that and figured this is what our attitudes ought to be. As he goes through this sermon here to his people. We'll start in chapter 5 verse 1. It says, In seeing the multitudes, he went up on a mountain. And when he was seated, his disciples came to him. Then he opened his mouth and taught them. Jesus went up on the mountain. When, when the rabbi came to that place and sat down, to the disciples, that meant schools and session, guys. Pay attention. Okay? So he opened his mouth and he taught them. He said, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall obtain mercy. Blessed are the poor, are the pure rather in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness' sake, 
for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when they revile and persecute you and say all kinds of evil against you falsely for my sake. Rejoice and be exceedingly glad, for great is your reward in heaven, for so they persecuted the prophets who were before you. That word there that repeats in there, blessed are those, Another way of translating that Greek word would be, oh, how happy. Are these things will make you happy. These things are blessings. These things will bring you joy in your life. And these things are not the things that we think about when we think about blessings, are they? The first one there, poor in spirit. What does that mean? It means that we have to admit to ourselves and to the Lord that we are spiritually bankrupt, that there there is nothing good in us, no, not one of us, and nothing that we can do to fix that. We can't work on it. We can't change ourselves. We can't take a 12-step program for it or anything. We don't like to do that. Our typical mindset is, blessed is me when I have an excuse for all the stupid things that I've done. Huh. Not that spiritually poor. Blessed are those who mourn, for they will be comforted. I've done a a great many, well, not a great many, but uh, quite a few funerals and memorial services. And one of the things that I find all the time, I have yet to go to one where I did not find this, where the people there are talking about, well, I have to be strong. Because that's our mindset, right? We think that we're going to be strong and tough and we will endure and get through this. And this is what is going to see us through. This is where the blessing is going to be in the strength to deal with this. That's the opposite of what he's telling us here. Blessed are those who mourn. Man, break down. I would much rather be comforted by the Lord than to be strong. And what greater witness is there? My strength or the comfort of the Lord? Again, not quite the things that we think of of what would bless us, is it? Go ahead and mourn. The Lord will comfort you. There's blessing in that comfort. Blessed are the meek, for they shall inherit the earth. We don't want to inherit the earth. We want to take it over, don't we? People, maybe not us right here. We don't want to be meek about it. We want to be bold about it. We want to go and claim it for ourselves. All you have to do is read just a little bit of history to find out that that is true. Blessed are the meek. That meekness is power under control. The idea that comes with that is a horse that is trained, that we can control with a bridle and a bit. Someone once told me that somebody that was was into training horses and all that stuff, that if horses ever really realized how big and powerful they were compared to us, there's no way we would ever get on them. I've been around a few horses. Some of them have that figured out. (laughs) We don't want to be meek, do we? We don't like meekness. We want to be bold. We want to be strong. Blessed are the meek. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be filled. Our tendency is to want to think that we're right anyhow. Not necessarily for the righteousness that comes through Christ, but for the the rightness. We want to be right. You ever have an argument with anyone? Why? Because you want to be right, right? And one of the greatest things you can learn as a Christian, as a person, is that it's okay to let other people be wrong. It really is. That's fine. They don't have to agree with you. They don't have to see eye to eye. We want, in in, in this country especially, and I know it's around the world because it's what people want, we want the righteousness, the things that we think are right, to be accepted as right by everyone else, don't we? We want it to be accepted by everyone else. We don't hunger and thirst for the things that the Lord shows us is right, for His righteousness. But we hunger and thirst 
for us to be seen as right. Quite a different thing. We think we would be blessed when everybody agreed with us, wouldn't we? What a mess that would be. <laughs> blessed are the merciful, for they will obtain mercy. We want mercy for us, don't we? When's the last time you cried out in prayer, Lord, be fair with me? Not going to pray that, are you? How about, Lord, be just with me? Lord, show me your justice. Maybe on them. <laughs> Lord, show them your justice. Right? No, Lord, show me your justice. Uh-uh. Mercy every time. Mercy is not getting what you deserve. And he says, blessed, if you really want to be happy, if you really want to walk in that joy of the Lord, and if you really want mercy, then be merciful. You don't have to get back at everyone. You don't have to set everything right. Jesus says if somebody steals your jacket, your coat, your tunic, let them have it. Big deal. It's not beyond him to, to find you another one. Be merciful. If somebody takes advantage of you, somebody rips you off, well, you got to get on the phone and straighten that out, don't you? There's some stewardship issues there, but you know what? Let the Lord deal with them. I think he's much better at dealing with those things than we are. Isn't he? We want mercy. He says, if you really want mercy, if you really want to be happy, if you really want to be blessed, be merciful. One of the things about mercy, one of the things about forgiveness that I think we miss is this. Forgiveness is giving up our right to exact punishment on somebody else's wrong. That's why we have such a hard time with forgiveness, isn't it? Sometimes we say we forgive, but we still want them to make things right. And in that, that bitterness is still there, isn't it? Be merciful, and you will obtain mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. We don't want to be real pure in heart just pretty cleaned up that comes back to that that pure heart is a heart that that looks to others first the bible says to esteem, esteem others more highly to than yourself that means to count them as more valuable than you are that's hard to do that pure heart is one that loves first not in response to others we want to be pure in response to those that have done us right. Have a pure heart. Heart set on purity. It goes back to the righteousness and all of that. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called the sons of God. We still sort of like the idea of the Roman peace, Pax Romano. They accomplished that by eliminating all of their enemies. You can have peace if you wipe out all your enemies. It'll work for a while, anyhow. But what if you love your enemies until they're your friends? Blessed are the peacemakers. The Bible also tells us that as much as depends on you to live at peace with everyone, what can we do to be peacemakers? A lot, huh? If we're hungering and thirsting for righteousness and all this other stuff. Blessed are those who are persecuted for righteousness sake, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. We tend to expect reward, and we will have it in heaven, but we tend to expect our life to go kind of the way we want it to, especially when we're living righteously. We don't really see persecution here in this country. But as the hills 
brought to our attention last week, a great deal of the world does for standing up for Christ. They are persecuted. We stand up, we live our lives righteously, we stand for righteousness, and we, we want the rewards that come with that. We want the, the, the victory of David, we want the blessing of Abraham, and all those things. If you read chap, uh, Hebrews chapter 11, it is the hall of faith, as some would put it. The first part of that is it talks about them. It shows that all these people who lived righteous lives before the Lord and the blessings that they got, the widows who got their sons back from the dead and all that. It goes on to say the part that we don't like is that there were those also who lived the righteous lives before the Lord that got sawn into, that got beheaded, that were destitute, that were hungry, that wandered in the wilderness and lived in caves and were put to death. I've yet to hear that on Christian television yet. Blessed were they. Is that their earthly reward for a righteous life? That's not what we want, is it? When's the last time we prayed, Lord, make us destitute so we can wander in the desert and live in caves? Lord, please send someone to saw me in two for my righteousness? I, I, I don't pray that way. I'm not going to either. <laughs> what do we see as blessing? What are our expectations? What do we want from the Lord? Do we want the comfort of the flesh? Or do we want what we know to be his spiritual best for us? Do we want all that the Lord has for us or just what we might obtain here in this life now? We expect blessing. We expect victory and all that like in Hebrews. We expect healing. There's a lot of that going on. A lot of stuff. You can, you can sell that on TV real well. A lot of healing. Do we expect healing? We want healing. We would like healing. It's our desire for our bodies to be healed. You know, I kind of want to go out like old Jack LaLanne. The guy died healthy. But that may not be the case. Paul, the Apostle Paul, remember Paul? He had some sort of, of thorn in his flesh. A lot of scholars think that it was some sort of eye problem. He came to the Lord. Paul, who had been used by the Lord to heal many people, he came to the Lord and he said, Lord, deliver me from this. Take this away from me. What did he get? grace. The Lord didn't take it away. The Lord didn't do that. He, Paul came to realize that the, the, the spiritual blessing in this was that it was there to buffet him because of the great revelation kept him from getting a fat head about all the things that he'd seen. The Lord says, no, I'm not going to heal you. My grace is sufficient for you. Which would you rather have? Which would you rather experience? Which would you rather others, unbelievers, see? The healing? That's great. Jesus healed ten lepers. One of them came back and said, thank you. We don't know what the others did. But time after time after time after time, the thing that wins the hearts of the lost to the Lord is seeing the grace of God. Oftentimes we cry out, Lord, deliver me from this trial, from this tribulation, from this uncomfortable situation that I'm in. Is it better to be delivered than to have the Lord see you through? Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fare no evil, because he's with me. What builds you up more as a believer what draws you closer to the Lord? To see the Lord with others through these hard times? Or to see them delivered? As we grow and we have maturity, both do. But what loving kindness we see. What our Father's love that holds us through the hardest of times, through the most difficult of times. 
His promise was to love us. There's a song somebody sings that's about that. So he didn't promise that we wouldn't have problems and deal with stuff in our life. But what he has promised us is to see us through those times, to be there with us. Nothing can separate us from the love of our Lord. What are our expectations? What are we looking forward to? What's going on? Will you take the temporal in place of the eternal and rejoice? Maybe for a moment. Because this life, as James says, is just a little vapor that passes away. God's heart and his love is eternal. His love for us is, is eternal. His plan to bless us. His blessings are eternal, not temporal. What do we expect? What do we see coming? What, what are we hoping in now? I don't know about you guys, but I'm looking forward to the rapture. You know, anytime, any minute, any place, anywhere, boom, gone. You know, for some reason I get, you remember that... Uh, Imperial Margarine commercial. The one where do, 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 Bing, the crown was there. That's that's the rapture. Like that. I mean it'd be better than that, but that's the you know, just like that. Anytime, anywhere. That's the next thing. That's the next thing. Do we get so caught up in the things of life and the temporal things of today that we lose sight of that? Do we get so caught up in the, in the very things of this life? That we, have no ex that we lose the expectation of that being called home, that being transformed? Do we get up saying, Lord, Maranatha? Lord, today? Lord, right now? Do we have that expectation? Are we looking forward to those eternal things and those eternal blessings? Are our eyes just focused on the temporal things? Yes, we have the temporal blessings. Yes, we have promises for this life. And they see us through, and that's a good thing. Praise the Lord that we do. The Jews, in Jesus' day, missed their Savior. A good many of them did. Because their expectations were temporal. Their expectations were fleshly. Their expectations were selfish. They wanted a Messiah, a king, to serve them. They were not looking for a Savior to die on the cross, to pay the price for their sins, to set them free from that bondage of sin and assure them eternal life with Him in His presence. They were looking for the temporal things. When they didn't get them, they were disappointed. That same crowd that cried out on that day of his triumphal entry, Hosanna to the Lord Most High, that same crowd, a little while later, were in the courtyard before Pilate, crying out, crucify him. He didn't give us what, he want, what we wanted. Our question, what do you expect? Eternal blessing? Spiritual blessing? Or temporal? Where's your focus? Where are your eyes? Will you miss what Jesus is doing in your life? Looking for the things of today? Will you be disappointed when you don't get the things of the world? Will you miss those spiritual blessings? Will you trade them? What are your expectations? Heavenly, eternal blessings from a loving Father who's in heaven. Or a new car. What are your expectations? <clears throat>